Hi everyone. Every era of naval architecture has its masterpiece, and the history of the British fleet is rich with many such remarkable ships. Among them, the Sovereign of the Seas, built in 1637, stands out not only for its extraordinary design but also for its profound impact on Britain's maritime history. The inception of this grand vessel came from King Charles I, who recognized the Navy's crucial role in safeguarding the nation. He envisioned a warship of unprecedented size and power, a 1,500-ton behemoth. This bold plan shocked the naval experts of the time. The Brethren of Trinity House, already struggling with limited resources to maintain ports and waterways, were concerned that such a massive ship might not even be seaworthy. Yet, the King was resolute, he was determined to create the finest man of war the world had ever seen. After overcoming the Admiralty's reluctance, Charles I entrusted Phineas Pett, the leading naval architect of the era, with the task of bringing his vision to life. Pett, along with prominent figures like Sir John Pennington and Sir Robert Mansell, crafted the plans for a ship estimated to cost £13,680. The King, impressed by the design, gave his approval, and construction commenced under Pett's supervision. To source the necessary timber, Pet traveled to the north of England, as local supplies were deemed insufficient. The first timbers were transported to London by ship, and on December 21, 1635, the keel was laid at Woolwich Dockyard. Despite pooling resources from both Woolwich and Deptford, it took 20 months to complete the ship, and costs soared far beyond the original estimate. By the time she was finished, the total expenditure had reached £40,833, including £6,691 spent on lavish decorations. Throughout the ship's construction, King Charles's enthusiasm never waned. He visited the dockyard multiple times, observing the ship's progress. The Sovereign of the Seas became the talk of the court, and even the waste materials from her construction were used to build two smaller ships, the Greyhound and the Roebuck. Finally, the King himself chose the name for this great vessel, Sovereign of the Seas. The grand launch of the Sovereign of the Seas was originally scheduled for September 25, 1637, in a ceremony to be attended by King Charles I, Queen Henrietta Maria, and a large entourage. Significant preparations were made, with around £500 spent on entertainment and ensuring everything was ready for the royal event. The guests eagerly boarded the ship, still resting on the stocks to inspect the magnificent vessel. However, disaster struck. Despite all efforts, the ship refused to budge. Stuck fast in place, panic spread among the dockyard officials. Fortunately, King Charles I remained calm and understanding, acknowledging that the situation was beyond anyone's control. He graciously agreed to postpone the launch to the next spring tide, scheduled for October 14. As the new date approached, a fierce gale blew in from the east, driving an unusually high tide up the river and placing the ship in peril. Fearing that the vessel might be destroyed, the master builder of Woolwich made a bold decision. Without waiting for the king's presence, he launched the ship under emergency conditions to secure her safely to the wharf. Meanwhile, Pet rushed to inform Sir Robert Mansell, the Vice Admiral of England, who quickly returned with him to oversee the ship's christening. This impromptu ceremony took place under the eerie glow of torchlight amidst the howling storm, creating an unforgettable and dramatic scene, likely one of the most unique ship launches in history. During the fitting out phase at Woolwich, King Charles I made another visit to inspect the Sovereign of the Seas. He scrutinized every detail of the ship, which was a source of pride for him. 
The Sovereign of the Seas was the Navy's first three-decker, featuring three flush gun decks along with a forecastle, half-deck, quarter-deck, and roundhouse. Her design was visually striking. The towering stern wharf, the exaggerated beak head at the bow, a remnant from galley designs. This outdated beak head was costly in terms of lives, but it provided an excellent canvas for intricate decoration. Her carved figurehead depicted King Edgar trampling the Seven Kings, while other symbolic figures adorned the ship's stem and forward bulkhead. Even more elaborate carvings covered the stern, making her one of the most ornamented ships of her time. The ship's measurements were impressive, 127 feet at the keel, 167 feet 9 inches overall, with a beam of 48 feet 4 inches and a draft exceeding 19 feet. Her tonnage was 1,683, and she was designed to carry a crew of 600 men. Her tall sides and lofty masts meant she needed substantial anchorage, 11 anchors in total, with the largest weighing 4,400 pounds. The Sovereign of the Seas was heavily armed, with 102 guns despite being nominally a 100-gun ship. The lower deck boasted 20 cannon drakes and 8 demi cannons, while the middle deck housed 24 culverin drakes and 6 culverins. Additional guns were spread across the upper decks, and numerous ports were cut into the ship's structure, including ones for murdering pieces to defend against boarding attacks. The immense cost of building this ship contributed to King Charles I's decision to levy the highly unpopular ship money tax, which inflamed public unrest. Despite her faults, the ship was beloved by the Navy. When the Commonwealth was declared after Charles I's execution, the new government proposed renaming the ship to Commonwealth. However, this sparked such dissatisfaction among the fleet that Oliver Cromwell relented, renaming her simply Sovereign, with the explanation that it represented the sovereign people. Cromwell was not the kind of leader to keep a costly yet ineffective ship in his fleet, especially one as expensive as the Sovereign of the Seas. In 1652, she was reduced to a two-decker, though she still carried 100 guns. Due to public demand, she was uniquely exempt from the Puritan mandate requiring all British warships to be stripped of their gilding and repainted in more somber tones. Once her conversion was complete, she joined Admiral Blake in the Battle of Kentish Knock against Van Tromp. Her yellow sides and gilded decorations made her stand out among the more austere, black-painted Puritan ships, earning her the Dutch nickname the Golden Devil. Her first test in battle proved her worth, and from then on, she became a constant presence in naval engagements. She participated in Blake's Battle of Lowestoft and in the Camperdown action, where Admiral Van Tromp was killed. The Sovereign of the Seas proved to be one of the most formidable and effective ships in the fleet. When King Charles II was restored to the throne in 1660, the ship was laid up at Chatham. The King made a special stop at the dockyard to see her. As a gesture of both sentiment and reconciliation, he rechristened her Royal Sovereign. This name set a tradition that would be carried on by future ships. The Royal Sovereign continued to serve with distinction during the Dutch Wars, under the command of Prince Rupert in 1673. In two of the battles, she flew his flag, and her captain, Sir William Reeves, was killed at Prince Rupert's side in the last of these engagements. In 1690, she served as the flagship of Lord Torrington in the Battle of Beachy Head and later, under Vice Admiral Sir Ralph Delaval, she was instrumental in the destruction of the French flagship Soleil Royal at the battles of Barfleur and La Hogue in 1692. The Soleil Royal, a ship reputed to be the most powerful in Europe, was no match for the Royal Sovereign. However, in January 1696, while awaiting a rebuild at Chatham, the Royal Sovereign was lost in a fire. The blaze was caused by a careless watchkeeper who left a candle burning in his cabin. 
Unfortunately, there was no adequate firefighting equipment on board, and despite attempts to get help from nearby ships, the fire consumed the vessel. Thus ended the career of the Royal Sovereign, one of the finest ships of her age. Though she caused many headaches early on, her illustrious combat record more than justified the troubles she initially created. Thanks for watching.